Hello, I'm Anna Raimondi, coming to you from the Angel Cooperative in Ridgefield, Connecticut. Welcome to this episode of Talking to the Dead in Suburbia. I am so pleased to welcome my guest today, Sharon Prentice. Dr. Sharon Prentice is an intuitive, collaborative, multimodality, transformational psychotherapist, a spiritually intuitive life coach, and an advanced temperament profiler. Sharon's practice was inspired by her sheer death experience, which resulted in her intuitive reintegration of body and soul. This experience led to the realization that an integration of psychology, spirituality, wisdom traditions, and divine essence is the path to healing. She brings her passion and gifts to her clients through a loving, accepting, more conscious embodiment of mind, body, and soul. Sharon is the author of the bestseller, Becoming Starlight, as well as a columnist for Simply Soulful on Huffington's Post Tribal Global. Her next book is entitled The Sacred Yes, which will be available in the upcoming year. That's a lot. That's a lot. That's a lot. Well, say, hey, Sharon, how you doing? Leave it at that. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm really excited about having you today because some of the things that, um, you know, you write about and talk about, I feel like many people aren't aware of, you know, especially in Starlight, you talk about your, share, your shared death experience. I find that fascinating. Can you talk about that and tell us what that is and kind of how it happened to you? Absolutely. Most people really have not heard of the shared death experience. I didn't even know what it was when it happened to me. Um, it's everyone, unless you've been living under a rock, knows what a near death experience is. Shared death experience is almost identical to the near death experience, except for one glaring exception, that the person having the experience, there's nothing wrong with them. They're well, they're, they're, they're totally fine. What happens if they are simply invited along to witness the aftermath of physical death. It's, it's you, you're there, you see it. Um, like I said, it's just like the, just like the near death experience. It, it is a fascinating peek into foreverness. That's what I call it. And how did you experience that? Uh, during one of the most traumatic events of my entire life. Um, my husband had was finally diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And so I spent my entire day, every day for six months at his bedside. And I was an absolute control freak at that time because previously I had lost my daughter and when she died, it was one of those things where I had decided that God did not exist. And if there was one, he was the, the meanest, most evil essence that, that the world had ever ever known, ever invented or whatever. So I had told myself, nope, he didn't exist. And if he did, I wanted nothing to do with him. So I set out to, it was a war, it was a battle. I wanted revenge on whatever this essence was that seemed to be coming after me. And was after my daughter died, major control freak. I had decided that nothing else bad was going to happen in my life. And the way to do that was to control everything. Well, while I was trying to control everything, my husband was getting sick. Nobody knew what was wrong with him. And long story short, he ended up having pancreatic cancer, which of course made me more angry, more full of rage, more controlling than any one person could ever fit into their body. So at the moment of his death, I was with him. I was right, I was actually right next to him, nose to nose. Um, and a couple of things happened that were medically impossible, which kind of makes you go, you know, what is this? And that was after a day full of cussing and swearing at a God, if one did exist, because I had convinced myself that through my control features, I was going to make sure that he didn't die. I could not afford to lose. Not one more thing. There wasn't, a, you know, there wasn't any of me left. I poured all of me into him. So at the moment of my husband's death, when I realized that he had died, something in me just died too. And I fell to the floor on my knees and I'm looking at him and I'm thinking, this is, 
And what do I do? And that was when I learned what surrender meant. You know, most people think surrender is failure, right? Surrender is not failure. Surrender for me at that moment was a here. Just take me here. This, this is me. Just just take me. Um, there wasn't anything else, you know, that that I could do. So it was a moment of realizing that all of the control in the world, all of the control in the world wasn't going to do anything, that I had failed, that he was gone. I didn't know where he was. Had he gone into nothingness? You know, because that's one of the biggest fears that people have, going into nothingness. And at that same moment, I rose, not powered by anything of my own. I don't know where that power came from. And then the room started doing these really weird things. My mom, my dad, and our oncologist was in the room at the same time. And they didn't understand what was happening to me either, because you can imagine what when someone has just died that you love, there's there's so much grief, there's no words for what was happening because everyone was thinking, first my daughter, now my husband, now me. They were afraid something was, you know, that I was going to have a heart attack or something for their husband. Either way, the ceiling started turning into just mist. I could see the ceiling, but it was turning into mist. I was standing on the floor and yet the floor was disappearing. The old ugly linoleum floors of the hospitals just started going away and the room just started moving out. And that was when I saw the stars. That's why the book is called Becoming Starlight. People tried to change my mind on that, but I would not change my mind because that is what happened. The room became starlight. Billions and billions and billions of stars. I could see each one of them independently. Each one of them was a unique star and yet, it seemed to morph into one big light, one big star, and I walked into it. I went into that light so happily, I didn't even question it. And you know why, Anna? I felt a presence within that starlight. I knew that place. I have described it as, I felt like I was going home. It felt like home. It was peaceful. It was calming and loving. Like I can't even describe. People have said to me, well, give me a word. I can't. There's no word. There is no human word for what that love and that peace and that calming felt like. And I found myself just being enveloped in this all encompassing peace. And within that peace, there was joy and there was I want to say happiness, but it wasn't happiness. It went so far beyond that, that I didn't need to say the word happy. I just was for the first time in forever. There was no rage. There was no anger. There was no hatred. There was no need to control. There was no need for anything except just to be in that love. And I saw my husband. He was there, which was shocking because he didn't, he looked like he did years before he had gotten sick. When he died, he was six foot three. And when he died, he weighed only 90 pounds. Because you know what cancer does to somebody? Mm. Nope. He was standing there looking great and looking beautiful and happy. He had a smile on his face. And um, it was, it was okay. That's the strange thing. People look at me and like, what do you mean it was okay? It was okay. Everything was exactly the way it was supposed to be. He was where he was supposed to be. I was where I was supposed to be. I have told people many times when they have asked me, why do I think I was given this, this experience, this blessing, this whatever you want to call it? I think it was two, two factions, really. I had set up this war with, with God, this existential battle. I was going to beat you. you know? I was going to beat him. I was going to beat death at their own game. And nothing bad was ever going to happen again. And I think Steve, that was my husband's name, actually said when he got to where he was, will you please throw this woman a bone? Because if you don't, if you don't show what's going on, she's not going to make it. 
So I think God finally said, I've had enough of you. <laughs> I want to show you what's going on. That's the only thing that I can think of as to why I was given this experience because I wasn't a spiritual person at all, at all. I mean, if there was a cuss word out there, I, I threw it out at this entity that people call God, this all loving, no, 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 that wasn't me at all. So there was nothing special about me. So all. based upon this experience, yeah. And, and, and people who have NDEs, oh, they, they talk about the light. Right. Is the light God? Oh, um, oh my Lord, I wish I could answer that for you. Because I don't know. Walking into that light was, I didn't see a God. Okay, I didn't see Jesus or Buddha or any of the, you know, the, the, the prophets that, that we think of. I felt, okay, it was, it was a sense that that's where I belonged. Now, is that what God is? Going home to where you belong? That is, that is a really good question. Um, was that God? I would have to say the essence. Yeah, you know, it's wanted. interesting because even when I do, you know, readings with people, they, everybody's so interested and in, do you see my father, mother, sister, brother? It's really about what I feel. Yes. It's feeling the essence of their souls. Like to me, God is the essence of love. And yet, I listened to so many, you know, near death experience stories and now your SDA and there's the light. Mm -hmm. So the light, I don't know the way that I would translate it, listening to all these stories is the light is the, um, almost the physical manifestation of the love. Okay. Yeah. Is the vibration. Yeah. Of the love that, you know, but everybody sees it. So it's um, like, we, you're kind of like still in the material world during an NDE yes. or an SDE. And it's like, wake up, go into the light and then feel it. You could, would you agree with that? I absolutely agree with that. I, I have had major debates with a lot of my colleagues about what did you see? What did it, it wasn't that I saw. It was what you just said. It's this overriding feeling of belonging and love. Like I tell you, love like I've never found on this earth mm -hmm. ever. I hear people talk about unconditional love and sometimes I kind of smile because I think, yeah, no, that doesn't even come yeah. close. I mean, if we're even capable of that, you know, we all have world. expectations of, of other people, even our children. Mm -hmm. So it was just this overriding feeling of I, I would have been happy to stay there cocooned in that forever yeah and that's the same experience that so many people relate yeah so this was such a private experience such an experience that is hard to describe you yeah. know absolutely and so you wrote um you know you wrote becoming starlight based upon your experience when did you decide to write that and why you know, it was funny. I never, ever would have thought of, of writing this um, if it wasn't for what I do. I work with a lot of terminally ill patients. Matter of fact, my patient profile up until recently, my the patient population was mostly terminally ill and their families. A lot of hospice work, a lot of, you know, stuff at the hospital before we transfer them to hospice if they want that home hospice. <coughs> it never failed. Never failed. The question would always be asked somewhere in the dying process, should I be afraid? And the only way I could answer that was to say, let me tell you a story. And so I started telling them my story because I understand death is not my, I can't, I can't control it as much as I try to. I learned that lesson. Like it doesn't work. Um, that, that is not my purview. But if I can take away someone's fear, even a little bit of it, that's what I want to do. So when the question would be asked, should I be afraid? Or what's out there? Or am I going to disappear? In whatever manner someone would ask it, 
I would always say, let me tell you a story. And then I'd climb up next to him, which I got in trouble for a lot, but I didn't care. Climb up next to them and I would tell them the story. And so what happened over the years as this progressed, the families would say to me, could you write that down? Could you, could you just, you know, write us a paragraph or two or, or, or write this down? And so we, you know, we would have it so we can go back to it in the future and look at it again and just remind us. Because people, people still think the concept of closure actually exists. Okay. <laughs> you know, I don't know. That's a whole new podcast when it comes to whether there's such a thing as closure or not. So having the story in front of them, they could go back and remember that the person they lost, lost some of the fear through this story. So I finally decided I got to write this. And I originally wrote it just for my patients. Um, and then it just kind of flew out from there. Um, well, yeah. you know, the universe doesn't bring us things that are random, you know, and it's, it's so, you know, it's, it's so deep. So you went through your experience as a healing for you. Yeah. But then you brought it to the world. And so that other people could be healed, which is your journey, you know, and so people can understand what is going on. And I thank you for that. Okay. And if any of you out there have not read her book, um, Becoming Starlight, it's available on Amazon and other booksellers. It's, it's a very, um, it's a very good book. So you work with people um, who are in hospice and their families. Um, are these STDs, STDs, STDs? Okay. <laughs> I hope they're not STDs. <laughs> That's quite all right. No, don't mess that up. Um, yeah, that is not what it is. Are these um, are these SDEs rare? You know, they're not. They're not. People don't know what they are. I didn't know what it was. It took Dr. Moody, my one of the loves of my life, to say, "Oh, I know what that is," and explain it to me. I I tell you, and I would scream this from the mountaintop. I do not believe that there is a person in this world that has not had some type of spirit, spiritual experience, mm -hmm. but they don't know what it is and no. they're afraid to talk about it because they don't want to be called idiots. Yeah, you and know, it's or you're crazy or you're right. whatever, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. So many people after they read Starlight, I got inundated with emails saying, hey, this is what happened to me, or I know what you're talking about, or I never knew what it was called. I didn't know the name, you know? Um, there's, there's a lot of people out there that have had experiences like this that are finally starting to talk about them. So are you going to put that in a book and give it out to us? You know, here's the thing about that. There, there are some, some projects out there. One's called the Crossing Over Project, where it's basically a lot of shared death experience people or, or, or experiences that are almost like that. Um, that's a that's a good that's a good question. I think people need to know what it is, and people mm -hmm. need to know that it is more acceptable now to listen to these because I honestly believe that there's some type of it sounds so philosophical, some type of global awakening going on where people are finally starting to understand that we are more spiritual than we are physical, and we are. We it's are. just what we see, you know. Um, and admitting that part of ourselves is that is so missing today. That is a missing link in psychology as far as I'm concerned too, because if the spiritual goes down, the entire system crashes. So how, in talking about psychology, how did your peers accept this? Um, at first, I would get the rolling of the eyes and, you know, because when you are totally scientifically based, sometimes it's difficult to accept mm -hmm. the other side, you know. Um, the people that accepted it first were the surgeons. Because surgeons have seen things yeah. that, you know, and, and, you know, there's the hierarchy in medicine. You know, you start with the neurosurgery all the way at the top and they're the ones, you know, um, that have seen, they've seen so many things that all it takes is one person to say, yeah, this is real. She knows what she's talking about. And then it, it starts growing and growing and growing. And nowadays, spiritual psychology and spiritual surgeons and, and, I'm using the word spiritual. You can substitute any word that works for you. Um, they're actually starting to talk about their their experiences and and 
the things that they are seeing that brings this all home. So it's, it's all pretty accepted right now. Matter of fact, when Starlight first came out, I had to start turning people away. I actually trained uh, six people around here to do the type of work that I do because I couldn't take it every time. Everybody wants to talk about their experience now, which I think is great. You know, it's interesting. When I was writing conversations with Mary, one of the questions I asked her is why, you know, like people like Evan Alexander, you know, he gives credibility to an NDA. Why, why are, you know, those kind of people coming out? And she says, because in this culture, that's what we look to, you know, that's where we put our trust. And so more and more highly educated people are coming out saying this is real and it's an awakening. It's a global awakening, yes. you know, um, especially in the United States, because we're so heady. You know, oh, we yeah. process everything and we don't, you know, we go back to feeling again. We've forgotten what it, what it's like to really feel, to yeah. know the truth, you know, that, that the, the wisdom within us. And, right. you know, I'm so happy that people like you and Eben and Dr. Moody have been bringing this forward and you practice um, spiritual transformative therapy. Yes. What's the difference <laughs> between that and just run on the mill, you know? Run-of-the-mill, run-of-the-mill. I, I started not knowing how to incorporate the spiritual into the psychology, uh, you know, the, the Western mode of psychology, because it, it wasn't there, you know? And the more I worked with people, the more I saw, oh, oh, this, is, this, is a, this is a spiritual longing, okay? People are longing for something, and I had to define what that something was. And then I found this little ditty called temperament profiling, which I absolutely love. Pastor counselors use it a lot. Now, this goes all the way back to the time of Hippocrates. Dr. Moody and I talk about this all the time, um, which is basically, this is who you were when you were born. You know, it's like God said, hmm, I want to show the world this part of me. So bam, there's Anna. Okay, so you come into this world with these special gifts because that's the way you were created by God to be. You are that thought. So when I started doing the temperament profiling and I started sharing this with people, it just opened up this can of worms, you know, because it's like, that's why I do what I do. This is what I need. I'm too far away from that. Um, this is on a soul level, isn't it? We, yeah. And I have told people for years and years that, that the problem I think in our society is that we're lonely. We're not only lonely for friends, but we're lonely for ourselves and we're lonely for that connection mm -hmm. to this, this God, this, this spiritual being that we are all part of and he's part of us. You know, I follow the mystics a lot and getting into that heart of hearts, you know, it just opens you, it just breaks it open. Um, and so that's why I do the, I call it transformative because it is, it is a transformational. When someone says, I get it, that's who I am. That's who I'm supposed to be. And they find that God in them and they connect to that spiritual part of themselves. Their life just takes off. So did you coin that? Did you coin the title of it? No, there are a lot now of transformational psychology programs. There are a lot of spiritual programs that are out there doing their thing. What I did was put counseling psychology, temperament profiling, which is basically pastoral, and the spiritual component all together. I didn't mean to. <laughs> it just kind of, it just all fit. It all fit. Um, and I found that it worked so well that it, it was a transformational approach to helping someone starting with spirit. So that's the manifestation of God in you coming out, which is wonderful. Thank really you. Wonderful. So your, your next book is called The Sacred Yes. What do you talk about in, in that book? That is based on what we are just talking about. So many of my clients now women will come in dressed to the nines. You, you know what I'm talking about. They come in and they want to impress, right? And I'm known as a sweatshirt doc. <laughs> yeah, because you know, when you do the type of work I, I do, um, you get thrown up on the line, you get chemicals all over you and all of that. And, and you don't want to 
you know, wearing nice. So I wear sweatshirts and I'm hugging people a lot. So sweatshirts. So they call me sweatshirt dog. So I'm sitting in a sweatshirt and they come in dressed to the nines and I just let them sit, you know, and then finally the words will come out. I don't recognize myself in my life. And so I do the temperament profiling. I can really get into it. And all of a sudden that, yes. And we build boundaries and we, and we build those boundaries based on who they're supposed to be, you know, that unique thought that they were supposed to be. And all of a sudden they find that, yes, yes, that sacred part of me that I've been hiding away, that I've squirreled. I call it the underside of the soul. Okay. I don't know why, I don't know where that came from, uh, except given to me um the other side of the soul is where we hide everything we do the shadow work mm -hmm. and when you pull all that out right that what i call the sacred yes has been waiting to come out and play and once it starts screaming you know it's like here i am where they're like yes this is me you know and it kind of builds off of sherry salad is a good friend and sherry wrote her book the beautiful no i love her book so the sacred yes kind of builds on the beautiful no because the no is, I don't know if you read Sherry's book, but the no is like, no, I'm not doing that anymore. No, I'm not, you know, but the sacred yes is, yes, this is who I am. Yes, this is what I need. Yes, I can do this because this is who I was made to be. So that's what the book is about. It's actually a profile. I've got 12 amazing women from really all over the world. Miriam Ibrahim, you may know who Miriam is. Years ago, she was thrown in a Sudanese prison. Mm -hmm. uh, yep, Miriam's in it. And some of the, Tina Alster, who is one of the world's top dermatologists, people look at Tina and they think, wow, she's got it all together. But her life story is absolutely incredible. Um, I've got a monster truck driver. I've got women who've lost children. I've got, I've got a little bit of everything in there for women whose lives, women who were living according to someone else's agenda. When is this book coming out? I can't wait to read it. I know I can't wait to read it either. You know, what's interesting. I was talking to my editor yesterday. I'm thinking it's going to be out in about six months because we're actually changing it up just a little bit. Uh, the publishers were like, hey, we're going to turn this into a manual. This isn't going to be just a book. This yeah, is I think that's a good idea because I'm yeah. thinking you need to teach this. Yeah, we're going to turn this into a manual. They're like, we're going to put, you know, boundary making, how to make them properly because most people, when they make their boundaries, they'll say things like, I'm not going to let so and so do that anymore, do that to me anymore. Instead of today, I'm going to live to my highest and best self. You know, keep the negatives out because when you when you hear the I am not going to, it puts you back in the frame of mind of the bad things that are happening to you. Mm -hmm. When you change it up to where it's all positive, then it's like, woohoo, you know, <laughs> I'm ready to go. So uh, they're like, we're going to do some boundary building. We're going to show people how to do that. We're going to find these other women. We may do something about temperament profiling. Um, you know That's how to very get exciting. To it is. I'm I'm so excited about this because it didn't start out to be this way. Um, it yeah, kind of, it's so nice how God kind of leads you in the place that you need to be. I would have out been. at A, and somehow you wind up at C. Uh, you know what? I didn't even start at A. I was just this kid. You know, everything in my life had always gone so perfectly. There'd never been anything. I was one of the lucky ones. I had two of the best parents in the entire universe. Everything I ever wanted came my way. Didn't matter what it was. You know, it was, you can call it privilege. You can be, call it being a spoiled brat. You can call it anything you want to call it. Everything just came my way. Nobody in my family had ever died. And then my daughter died in my arms. What do you do with that? You know, and then with my husband, I had, I would not be doing what I'm doing now had this not been given to me and sent me on my way to do what I had to do. I, I, I can tell you quite honestly, I didn't choose this. I, really well, didn't. I am so sorry those things happened to you, but I'm so happy that you took them in a way that you can help so many other people because yeah. without those experiences you I wouldn't be yeah nah I wouldn't be doing this yeah I, wouldn't be doing this. I still get letters and cards and all kinds of things from the families of people that we lost you know 20 years ago and they're all still in my life and you know when the kids are born you know and your grandkids need this this and it's it's truly 
been one hell of an experience, you know, helping people get rid of fear and letting them know that. Yeah, that's a hard thing. The nothingness. Yeah, you know, mm. that the fear mm. and the fact that people just can't wake up to anything that's outside of the material world yeah. is, is very sad. It but is. you know what? We got a lot of light workers out there bringing them to the forefront. Yeah. So I thank you so much. Well, thank you, Anna. This is great talking oh, to somebody who wonderful. gets it. <laughs> this has been absolutely wonderful. Um, to all of you out there, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If so, please like, share, and comment. And be sure to subscribe to our channel so you never miss an episode. Thank you so much, Dr. Sharon. I appreciate this so much. I love talking to you today. Well, thank you, Anna. This was absolutely terrific. What you do is... You're, you're irreplaceable, sweetie. I love it. Thank you.